Um, anyway, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce today our guest speaker, Steve Cousins. I know many of you know of him um, from his past work. Uh, Steve has had a lot of impact on the robotics community. Um, years ago, he was the uh, CEO of Willow Garage. And one of the things that Willow Garage did that was really impactful for our community was try to set some standards that would allow us to, you know, uh, collaborate and grow this robotics enterprise at a much greater rate than it had been in the past. And they did this through two things. One was they introduced the PR2 personal robot, which started showing up in labs all around the country. Really great hardware that people could use for dual arm, you know, vision-based research. Um, but then even bigger than that was the development of the robot operating system. So that came out of Willow Garage in the late 2000s, early, well, that's where it started. And now, of course, it's been continuously developed since then. And then Steve is also one of the founders of the Open, Open Source, Source Robotics, Robotics Foundation, yeah. which is now called Open Robotics. Or... That's, yeah, that's a shorthand. Yeah. Um, so those, those things were really impactful for our society. Now, as all of you know, we're, we're continuing to use those today. And there's an uh, industrial ROS <laughs> and, and companies are adopting it. And so it's had huge impact in robotics. So after that, Steve also uh, went on to start Savioke, am I pronouncing yeah. that correctly? Which is now Relay Robotics, the founder and chief technical officer making uh, robots for, uh, for various industrial applications, uh, delivery robots, and he'll talk about that today. And just uh, since November, Steve is now, in addition to his role at uh, Relay Robotics, is the executive director of the Stanford Robotics Center. In 2017, he was honored with the IEEE IFR Entrepreneurship Award for all of his contributions to robotics. So please join me in welcoming Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. And I don't know how to make this thing stop showing up on the screen. I keep doing it and it keeps coming back. So maybe it will stop. Anyway, um, so great to be here. Um, I almost came to Northwestern as an undergrad. I grew up in Glenview, um, but it was too close to home. And so I decided to go to Wash U in St. Louis instead, just far enough away. Um, but uh, I've always known about um, computer science here, for, certainly. And um, over the last decade or 15 years or so, I've uh, got to know Kevin and got to know about robotics here at Northwestern as well. Um, so I, I called this talk Impact First um, after a slogan that I'll tell you about at Willow Garage. Um, but really, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is how do we advance robots in the real world um, from research? So I have a lot of experience in research um, on the research side of things, but trying to bridge that gap out to the real world, and, and I've spent the last 10 years, as Kevin mentioned, doing a startup, gave me a really interesting perspective on what it takes to get going. So I'll tell you about um, three organizations uh, that, I, that I've worked with, Willow, Savioke, and now um, Stanford. I won't tell you much about what I've done at Stanford since I just got there. I'll tell you what we're planning to do. Um, but I wanted to start with this one. I, I, I call this equation one as a little bit of, of a tongue in cheek because this would be the only equation in the talk and it's not really an equation. It's like a chemistry equation it has an arrow in it and it doesn't exactly mean anything, those arrows. I'm not a big fan of chemical notation, but, um, <laughs> but the golden rule, it's like, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or taken a little bit more pragmatically, think about the perspective of the person you're dealing with and what they care about, right? And really keep that front and center is a really important piece. And it'll, you'll see it comes through um, in, as a way to have impact. Um, and then the second one is, is focus. Um, focus, you hear about focus, um, maybe you don't hear about it as much in universities. You hear about it a lot in business. Um, you got to really focus. We got to really focus. Um, and I'll tell you uh, some stories about where we've tried to focus and when it goes well and when it doesn't go well. It coming out of academia, coming out, you know, I did a PhD at Stanford and then I worked at Xerox Park, which is a research center, and I worked at IBM Research. And those places are not necessarily focused, right? That's sort of the opposite. You're in a research, it's the Wild West. Every professor has their own lab, they have their own vision. Um, and they're all, you know, every PhD student gets credit for what they did. It has, it's what, what I did, right? And so everybody has to do their own thing. It has to be unique. 
And so that's the opposite of focus. It's the opposite of a whole team of people getting together, trying to do one thing. But focus really does have a big, um, is a big contributor to impact. Okay, so I start with this picture. This is not me in the picture, um, but that robot in the upper left is uh, a robot that I worked on in the 90s um, from Nomadics. Um, and um, uh, actually the woman in the picture was my classmate, PhD student. But the interesting thing about this robot, we spent forever um, trying to make it navigate down the hall. It only had a ring of sonars and a ring of infrared sensors, um, 16 of each, and you were trying to make it navigate to a location. And I concluded this, we, I was successful. We were able to get it to go down the hall and stop in front of a doorway. Um, my conclusion from that was, well, this was dumb. I spent the entire quarter getting this robot to go to some location, and now what? There's nothing to do here. And I kind of walked away for robotics, at least mobile robots, for a while. And then, you know, 15 years later, I built this robot. <laughs> I built a company to build this robot, which does exactly that, goes to a doorway and delivers something to somebody. Um, and it's been going for 10 years. So don't believe everything you think, I guess, is the message there. Um, all right, so part one of the talk, let's talk about Willow Garage. Willow Garage was um, uh, an interesting, I had an interesting opportunity. Um, I worked with um, a guy who uh, ended up doing a number of, he was a very busy, busy guy. He, I, I hired him as an undergraduate intern. When he moved to California and I was a PhD student, I convinced him not to do a startup, but to come to Stanford instead. And he turned around and helped Larry and Sergey write Google at Stanford. And he also did um, something which became eGroups um, and basically made a ton of money and suddenly showed up back in the Bay Area, came back into my life um, some years later and said, hey, I moved back to Palo Alto. I'm thinking about starting something new. Do you want to join? Look, I bought this building. Like, you know, this guy had been dirt poor when I first knew him. Um, and but he did an amazing thing, and he he created this Willow Garage entity and um, and asked me to join as the CEO and kind of get it going. And um, the interesting thing about Willow was we had money, we had no people, and we had no reputation. Um, and now we have this thing again. Oh, every time somebody wants to come into the room, this thing's going to pop up on the screen. I don't know why. I'll keep hiding it. Okay. Um, so this is about Willow Garage. It was a, th we don't know what it was. <laughs> we, we, I refer to it as a think tank or an incubator or sometimes a halfway house for wayward PhD students on their way to startups, right? It was one of those things. Um, it existed for only six years. Um, met, mantra was, and we said this out loud at the time, impact first, return on capital second. So it's a startup, it's funded, it's not funded by VCs. VCs care about return on capital. Is funded by uh, by a, an, a billionaire, and and I'll tell you later if you ask me why I have a no billionaires policy in my life, um, but uh, it ended abruptly um, after six years. Um, we started with three large projects, not just the PR two and Ross. We started with uh, actually a, a self driving car project. It was two thousand seven. The DARPA Urban Challenge was going on. Um, Scott Hassan, who founded it, had, had found a team of people who were kind of working in their garage doing self-driving cars and hired them and outfitted them. And we didn't do that well in the Urban Challenge. Um, but that was a project. He had a self-driving or uh, autonomous boat that didn't actually take any people. Turns out it's hard to debug a boat that's supposed to go on the ocean if it doesn't have any people. Like there's nowhere for you to ride and debug it. Um, but small side detail. Um, and then I thought we'd round out the portfolio by adding the PR2 personal robots project. Um, but we end up killing two to focus on one because um, Scott argued you have to focus, right? You can't be a world-class organization if you're trying to go off in three directions. And we wanted to be a world-class organization. And we, since we didn't do well in the DARPA Urban Challenge, we said we're going to end that project and focus on one that we believe we can be world-class in. And history proved right. In six years, we end up creating Ross, and it's obviously continuing to have an impact more than 10 years after the demise of Willow. Um, other interesting work there, um, that you, I'm not sure everybody who was there would tell the story this way, but for this purpose, I'm telling you the story this way. Other stuff we just spun out. It didn't actually happen that way, right? You're, you're working, some idea comes up, you want to pursue it, it's exciting, 
um, and it gets pursued for a while as kind of a side project, but that's taking away from focus. And so the drive was always when we step back and think about these things, let's spin them out. Turtlebot, we decided not to pursue as a commercial project within Willow, and we licensed it out, and other companies have been making Turtlebots. Different companies made different generations of Turtlebots. Um, telepresence robot, um, we called it the Texi, and it became uh, the Beam uh, telepresence robot. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and was not successful, but we did spin it out. And then in Industrial Perception was another company that Google bought along with a whole bunch of companies that Google bought when they were getting into robotics. Um, and there were 85 people at the peak of Willow. So just to give you a sense of the scale, that was, that was the size of the place. Um, here's the PR2, and this is just a little uh, four minute video that I'll talk over to give you some highlights. So one thing was we're getting started in this new company was we set milestones. The first milestone was to navigate two pi kilometers. Why two pi? Because uh, Scott said, you have to pick a number. Pi is a good number. Um, so we did. By the way, Google's um, IPO was $2.7 billion, which was E billion dollars. It's kind of a joke they had. Um, a lot of cool things that this robot could do. We started without arms. We, um, we were developing the arms in parallel. We made the base navigate, eventually navigated an entire um, uh, marathon distance. Um, we did um, uh, this opening door. So, so the first milestone was, can you basically navigate um, two pi kilometers? The second one was, can we show off the arms? And so the robot was supposed to plug itself in, uh, open doors, go into a room, plug itself in. And it turned out the hard problem wasn't, well, plugging in is not trivial. And we wore out a lot of wall sockets learning how to do that. Um, but the, the hard thing was when you went into a room to plug yourself in, you know, the plugs are always under the desk and this robot doesn't bend down and crawl, right? And so you end up having to take the furniture out in order to make it plug itself in. That is actually, that's Scott in the front there and Larry Page, um, who were the, Larry was on the advisory board. Um, and so the third milestone was let's launch this PR2, right? Let's, so first one was make it navigate. Second was make the arms work. Third one was make a bunch of them and give away. The goal was to give away 10. We kind of failed. We couldn't identify 10. We gave away 11. Um, and then we put them for sale. And this total of like 50 PR2s got sold around the world. Um, and um, so this was, that was Scott at the launch of this thing. And then now we've, uh, the fourth milestone by the way was Ross. And I think that'll come up here. But after we got the robot basically working, the question is, what can we do? So that that beer beer me video, which you can find on YouTube if you search for beer me, or this pool playing video, pool shark, they were both done in a one week. So like we decided, oh, we're going to do this, and a small team of like five or eight people just used all the stuff we had built and try to do those things fast. Also, they only worked for that week. <laughs> we didn't actually keep them running, and that's one of the challenges. Was like you want to build something and build on it, but plugging in at milestone two worked, but it never worked again. Um, and so that's one of the interesting challenges, right? You know, like you, you work really hard to get that ICRA paper out and you get the video done and everything's good. And if your advisor asked you for a demo three weeks later, it's a crapshoot, probably doesn't work, right? Unless you set that as a goal of like keeping it running, it's not there. Um, this was the, um, the towel folding that was done at Berkeley with the PR2. So I'm just, th this um, video I cut down from a long video that was sort of like highlights of what we did at Willow Garage that was done at the end, a retrospective. Um, so um, that's kind of a, this was a very exciting time. It was only six years um, uh, and uh, a lot of stuff happened as you can see, you know, this, imagine having a, a very capable robot and you have the only, well, there's a, there's a bunch of them in the world but we had 10 at Willow. And so the fact that you had like 10 of these very capable robots and everybody's working on it was pretty interesting. This was done at MIT. Um, and, you know, you see some kind of uh, compliance. So a lot of things that, um, you know, maybe not the first time it's done in the world, but we're, like anything, you're trying to replicate uh, other, you know, work that's out there and, and get it done. Um, Oh, interesting. And I look back on this video. This was from 2013. Um, the image recognition was terrible. I mean, we, we were working really hard on it. We spun out industrial perception. But in remember, in uh, just before that, 
is when the AI boom started to really hit with you know ImageNet and stuff. And so um, it was, I would say terrible. It was state it was good state of the art, but the capabilities in the world exploded like right after that. Um, there was interesting work on grippers and this was the statement at the end, like we changed the world of robotics. Did we change the world, right? And I, you know, the jury's out, but we created, and one of the goals was uh, uh, that Scott had by shutting down Will Garage was to send all these people that we had brought together out into a diaspora and start other companies. And if you look around robotics companies, you see a lot of Will Garage alumni. So it was painful for me, right? I spent six years building this company, bringing great people together, but then, um, at the end, that can look out in the world and say, wow, there's a lot of companies that wouldn't exist if we hadn't shut down. So it's, a, um, it's, a, it's an interesting perspective. Um, I won't say a whole lot about Ross. I think, does everybody know Ross? Um, uh, pretty happy with what it is. Um, um, but I'll tell you the story about how it got so fast, so big, so fast, because I think this is really interesting. Um, and the way I think about it is we created a pandemic, but not the pandemic, that's not our fault. Um, but, but the pandemic we create is really using um, a sort of the same model of um, disease transmission, but not disease, Ross is not a disease. Um, but we had this intern program and, um, and, and this is part of this, I was talking about the golden rule at the beginning. So now think about your research center and you wanna attract the best interns in the world to come over. And Google's offering great salaries and Microsoft and Facebook are all offering, the, you know, they're competing for talent, right? The PhD, pro, PhD students around the world want to go somewhere and everybody wants the best interns. How do you get those interns to choose Will Garage, this unknown place, over one of these other places? And the answer is, think about it from their perspective. If you go to Google, all of your code that you write in the summer is going to be owned by Google. If you come to Will Garage and your stuff is open source, everything you do is still yours, right? It's still, it's still out there for everybody. And furthermore, Everything everybody else is doing is also yours. That was the, the Ross thing. And so what happened is we were able to attract great students and then they came and they worked hard and they made their stuff work together in this environment. And then they went back to their labs and infected them with Ross because it was free and they could. Um, and we were actually up against Microsoft Robotics Studio. Right? Microsoft was trying to give away um, you know, academic free, free stuff to academia in order to try to seed um, into industry later. And of course, everybody knows that it's going to cost money later. Ross was free and open source and you could see everything. And so everybody chose Ross because it was engineered up to the level, you know, com a competitive level. Um, and we also, um, it also took off because there were other open source systems out there, right? It's not the only open source system in the world. The difference is if you create an open source system in a university with, you know, three graduate students in a lab and say, hey, we're gonna open source this. That's great. Um, but when somebody's gonna decide, are they gonna depend on that or something that's supported by a 15 person engineering team at Will Garage, plus some researchers and all these interns, it's not really, I mean, if you think about it, it makes more sense, right? So we put ourselves in the mind of our, of our intended customers, which was the students, and we got this accidental pandemic of Ross got spread everywhere. And so within just like three summers, it was like most universities in the world, robotics labs were using Ross because it was just the right choice. Um, so open source is a, is a key piece. Um, tying, the other thing that Willa did, which was interesting. So I came out of research background. So if I'm building an organization, I might've thought, oh, I'm gonna hire, I have 60 people, I'll hire you know 50 researchers and 10 support staff. Scott came out of, building uh, companies and, and products. And he said, we need more engineers than that. And so we consciously limited to 10 researchers out of a staff of 60, uh, initial staff of 60, and, and say 40 engineers and then another 10 support staff. And that balance um, worked really well because Ross became much stronger with those you know, dedicated engineers who weren't trying to figure out whether they could do the next thing, which might succeed or fail. Um, but they weren't only doing that. You had people, you know, world-class researchers in computer vision. We had like Gary Bradsky and um, Kirk Connellidge there um, who kind of knew what needed to be done. 
and then you have engineers who were actually going to build it, right? And that combination worked really well. Um, and of course, there was you know strong academic ties. So the other thing I say is we understood our customers. So why do we understand our customers so well? Because they were us, right? <laughs> we had researchers, and you're selling, we're selling Ross to researchers. So you're selling if you're selling to people exactly like you, you have really good intuition about what you want, what therefore what they want. Um, fast forward to a little bit, we'll talk about Savvy Oak when I'm trying to sell into hotels. I don't understand hotel general managers and what they need nearly as well as I understand robotics researchers or researchers in general. Oops, again. Okay, so just a couple of things. So um, after we kind of went through that stage of building the PR2, um, I did propose a project to the world. We had this robot community of PR2s out there. It's like 20 PR2s in the world at that point. I said, let's try to do something real. Let's try to do a sushi restaurant. So um, you imagine there's a table and it's got some stuff on it. And what you're supposed to do is just clear the table and then set the table with new dishes and then go off to a sushi plate and um, uh, and pick something up off a moving platform as though it's a sushi boat and serve it. All right? Th those are simple, three simple tasks, right? And, and we end up with um, people from all around the world working on this. We did a workshop in Freiburg and we did an ICRA challenge, big process. Um, but the first thing that, that the roboticists said when they looked at this problem was, can we get rid of the chairs? Like it's a restaurant, you can't get rid of the chairs. No, we have to get rid of the chairs, they're in the way because the PR2 can't bend over the way that a waiter can. And so immediately it wasn't a real problem anymore. Right, because you got rid of the chairs. We did, and then can we have 3D models of all the plates and everything we're clearing? Um, we didn't. I would say we didn't. Uh, we didn't solve the the perfect problem. We, we don't. You don't see PR2s in restaurants. Not to mention the fact that PR2 was 500 pounds and 400 thousand dollars. It was never going to be a solution, even though it was a commercial product. It was a research uh, product, um, but they did figure out, and we did figure out how to um, solve that problem autonomously. Um, and, uh, and we were able to uh, show a, an end-to-end -end autonomous solution at ICRA uh, for the sort of limited version of the problem with no chairs. And <laughs> in ICRA, there was a, a open, like a skylight with uh, lines. And when the sun was at a certain place, there were things that looked like chopsticks on the table, which was just shadows and that messed it up. But fortunately you could just wait and that problem would go away. The sun moves, um, but, um, but it was interesting. And um, the moving platform turned out to be the relatively easy part. We solved, had somebody solve it with teleop. So teleoping the PR2s. And then they tried to solve it um, autonomously. And the, the PR2's gripper was kind of had a, a slow close. So you couldn't just like snap. You, so when you're teleopping, you had to basically say close and like eh, waiting. And if things moving and you're trying to grab something, you would miss the teleop people. But the roboticists just looked at it like, oh, that's just one more degree of freedom going around, model it. And the robot would kind of stare at it for a while and then it would go, you know, just snatch it off. It was so beautiful uh, compared to the teleop. Everything else was real slow compared to teleop. Okay. Um, so first surprise for me in this whole thing, um, surprise. So we were shooting, you know, we were, we were trying to build the PR2 that was on purpose. We were trying to do the sushi challenge that was on purpose. Robots for Humanity was a surprise. We got a call one day. Um, actually, I'll let Henry tell the story. Hello, my name is Henry Evans. And until August 29th, 2002, I was living my version of the American dream. Hello. We should go to the next slide. Please. Head tracking devices sold commercially by the company Monden Tech. Convert my tiny head movements into cursor movements. And enables my use of a regular computer. I can surf the web, exchange email with people, and routinely destroy my friend Steve Cousins and online word games. This technology allows me to remain engaged 
mentally active, and feel like I am a part of the world. One day, I was lying in bed watching CNN when I was amazed by Professor Charlie Kemp of the healthcare robotics lab at Georgia Tech demonstrating a PR2 robot. I emailed Charlie and Steve Cousins of Willow Garage, and we formed the Robots for Humanity project. For about two years, Robots for Humanity developed ways for me to use the PR2 as my body surrogate. I shaved myself for the first time in 10 years. From my home in California, I shaved Charlie in Atlanta. <laughs> I handed out Halloween candy. I opened my refrigerator on my own. I began doing tasks around the house. I saw new and previously unthinkable possibilities to live and contribute, both for myself and others in my circumstance. So I, I won't show you the whole TED talk. It's uh, worth wrecking. I, I, I appreciate the fact that Henry, um, in his this TED talk that he gave in around 2012, um, got more hits on YouTube than all of the Willow Garage videos put together. So it's, it, it, it's, it's the power of story. But um, he's an amazing guy. Um, and. Um, what's amazing about this is 10 years later, um, he's on the cover of IEEE Spectrum, I don't know if you saw it a month or so ago, um, with the Stretch Robot, which Charlie worked for 10 years after PR2 um, and through PR2 to build this robot uh, with Aaron Etzinger and, uh, and make it really, Henry was one of the, the key use cases. And Stretch is a, is a great platform at this point, it's a research robot now, but something that Henry hopefully will be able to use in the future. Um, I let him, Henry, by the way, I, I leave in that joke about him beating me at words with friends uh, because earlier he says my tiny head motion. And I think well, he's going to give himself a shot with the tiny head so he can make a shot at me. Um, anyway, so that was, uh, that, was, um, that was a big surprise and a, and a big impact. And the reason that I want to stay, that kept me in robotics after, even after Willow ended, um, this was another surprise that came out of Willow. Um, this guy on the screen there is named uh, Dallas Gecker and Dallas lives in Indiana and was one of the engineers on the Willow Garage team. He was one of the only remote engineers. And he was trying to solve the problem of this Willow Garage thing is going on, all these people, it's amazing and I'm not part of it. And he kept asking for more and more AV support. Can I have a pan tilt in the room so I can look around eventually they said, well, he ended up building this whole cart for him in meetings so he could participate better. We realized we could just take PR2 casters and put them on the cart and make it into a robot that he could remote control. And so um, that actually is uh, the uh, Big Bang Theory actually rented uh, one of our robots and actually destroyed it. Um, but <laughs> to make it the Sheldon bot, they had to destroy it to take it, um, to put it in the car. At some point he's riding in the car with it and that didn't really work, um, but Hollywood. Um, but this one wasn't successful. What happened, right? Well, what happened is the world changed. And this is a danger for any startup, any new company going into robotics. Um, in this case, cell phones got really good. Smartphones came out. Everybody had a camera, which in 2012, people were like, the iPhone was out, but just starting it. We didn't have penetration. By you know five years later, you had everybody could just have a video call. And so this need to have a telepresence became less and Zoom came along. Um, I think this product would have been pretty amazing if it had been taking off during the pandemic, at least in certain circumstances, right? Having these in uh, senior living facilities when you can't go in and visit your loved ones would have been really powerful. Unfortunately, the company went under a year or two before the pandemic. Um, but Will Garage sort of, I'll end Will on this, um, you know, we had an amazing impact in only six years, there were eight spinoffs, um, five of them commercial and three non, uh, nonprofits. Um, we've had five exits um, and Ross Industrial came out, of course. Um, uh, and lots of companies, including Savvy Oak, which I'll talk about next, came out of there. So it, I'm, I'm pretty proud of this phase of my career. I was very lucky to you know, end up in the role of leading that and, and to get into robotics at the level that I was at that point. Um, okay, so that's part one. Uh, and 
I'll let any burning questions. Otherwise, I'll charge in. I think I'm probably behind time, my sense of time. Um, okay, let's talk about Savvy Oak. So um, Savvy Oak is the company that we originally created. It has the, um, so Scott spent a lot of time creating the, uh, paying for, trying to name the company for the telepresence. He actually went with the telepresence company, ran it. It was called um, Suitable Technologies. He spent thousands of dollars on a naming consultant to come up with the name Suitable Technologies. I saw that and I said, we're starting a new company. We don't have thousands of dollars. We have two hours and a whiteboard. And out of that came Savvy Oak, which was kind of like Savvy, like AI, and Oak because we were Willow Garage and Oak is a tree. And then we spelled it funny and got the domain. Boom, that's our name. Uh, it has the downside that it looks like Savvy Oaky. Kevin said it properly, but most people call it Savvy Oaky. And um, it's not quite easy to remember. It doesn't really evoke robotics in any way. So at some point, we end up renaming to Relay Robotics. Um, <laughs> This is not a staged video. This was a YouTube that somebody posted. What's it? Oh, we opened the door. Is it Wally? Oh, look, it's Wally. Oh my God, it's Wally! Let's see. It says hello. Remove your delivery. It says. Please remove your delivery. Wally, the butler. Wow. Okay, get it out, Julie. What does it have? Oh my god. Thank you, Wally. Thank you. I believe this game is for a Put on the This is so cool. And when you're done, it says hit all set the green button, Julia. It's all empty. All set. How was your stay? Give him some give him four five stars. Five stars. Oh! Five stars. <laughs> yay. He says yay. Thank you. I think Do you want anything else? Like anything else? An assistant? No. With anything else? Okay, I'm, okay, heading, I'm home. heading home. Uh, goodbye, oh my mom. god! Yeah, look, 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 he said bye! bye. Oh my god! Heading home. Bye. He blinked. <laughs> there he goes. Oh my god! Look, there he goes! <gasps> <laughs> what? Oh my god, he's fast. That's too cool! He's fast. Let me see him. Oh my gosh, no way! He's going. <laughs> Is he going to the elevator, Julia? Come on. No, no, come back. Come back. That's crazy. Wow. <laughs> That's too cool. I knew it had to be wrong. Yep, you're right, it was. So, um, yeah, I love that that video just to kind of show uh, what we designed initially for hotels um, and the kind of reaction. I, it's not the only reaction, like, you know, yes, go ahead. That is online. Uh, I don't know, I could send you a link. Send me. Um, but it's uh, it came out a long time ago, like this was 2015, I think. Um, it's one of the early hotels that had it and, um, and there was a, a blast, like, um, it's kind of inconceivable. We had um, 7 billion, with a B, media impressions, uh, two months after we launched this robot, right? Because people just were like, wow, uh, who who believed that you could actually have a robot actually doing delivery in hotels? Um, it turned out that that, that was the big thing, <laughs> the novelty. Um, hotels is... Um, we can, I'm not really going to talk about the business side here, but the hotels is modest product market fit for a delivery robot, right? The biggest problem, if you ask a hotel general manager, what's your biggest problem with your business? It's not, I can't get stuff to people in the room often enough. That's a good lesson for you can do a startup to think that through. Um, but uh, it turns out we were able to transition this to hospitals where getting blood samples down to the lab is something that's not going to get digitized, right? You, it's their atoms. The labs exist to turn those atoms into bits. You have to get it to the lab to make that transition. And so you have to physically move them. Same thing with medicine. You have digital representation of what medicine this patient's going to take, but it's got to turn into atoms and be, you know, given to the patient. Otherwise it's not going to be real. And so you have to transmit the medicine. Those are real problems that um, this robot turns out is a pretty good at, at a solution for. And 
you can't just go create a robot for, for hospitals right off the bat. If we created this robot and said to hospitals, why don't you adopt it? They'd say, well, where is it running? Does it work? How do I know? Can I depend on it? And it took a whole engineering cycle to get there. Um, so I'll just tell you a few lessons from, from this experience and sort of show you, you know, where we were. Um, so first use case is really simple. You're staying at a hotel and you need a toothbrush or a shaving kit or you're hungry and you call down to the front desk and you say, hello, can I have a toothbrush, for example? And the person at the front desk gets a toothbrush, puts it in the robot, types in the room number, and the robot goes off on its own to your room. And when it gets to your door, it calls your phone you open the door and when it sees the door open, so it opens its lid and you get out whatever it is that you were getting delivered. We designed this Robots are really complicated and we're trying to bring them out into the world where they can interact with people. And what we want to make sure is that when people receive that delivery in a hotel, it's, uh, it's exactly what they expect. And moreover, that they love interacting with our robot because we want it to be a, a, a fun experience for them. Design is really the process of asking, you know, what should those robots do and how should it do it? And what should they look like as, as they're performing those duties? What basic shape is this robot going to take? Where are we going to put items when we're sending deliveries? And how tall should it be? We actually went through about six different prototypes over the last nine months. And each step of the way with everything that we, we generated from one prototype to the next or one storyboard to the next or one sketch to the next, we were gaining more knowledge about what we think the best answer is. We wanted to be very friendly and approachable and not seem too big, especially like in cluttered hallways. The robot has a slender taper to reduce the visual volume. The base has a flaring towards the bottom to really make it seem planted and safe. There's even like a little arc just below the screen to make it feel happy. Oh. Sorry, cut him off. Happy is what he was saying. <laughs> um, so that was, so design, Design matters, and you can just tell from Adrian, who is an amazing industrial designer, uh, one of the co-founders, and Tessa, who's now running Dusty Robotics. Um, but you can you can just tell by the passion that we all had. Like we need to design a user experience here. We need to design something that people are going to be comfortable with, because we know that there was a book that came out from CMU. I think um, uh, it was called How to Stop a Robot uh, Uprising. Right? Remember that? And basically, it's the, the, the Bottom line is, you know, squirt guns and two by fours across the wall, pretty much across the way, will pretty much stop robots as we understand them. Um, and uh, it's a like we know people are going to be able to mess up with a robot if you want to do that. Um, so how do you prevent that? You prevent that by designing it so that people like the robot, so that they're helping it, that they want to help it, that they don't want to mess with it. Um, and this robot has, has even survived, you know, deployments in Las Vegas, which I think of as the pinnacle of, if you can survive a Las Vegas hotel, you can survive, it's a semi-hostile environment. Um, the biggest technical hurdle to deploying robots like this is elevators. Um, it's not, there's nothing robotic. Like we worked really hard on the navigation. It's smooth, people like it, it feels great. Um, but that's not what, uh, what's hard. What's hard is, getting, in order to integrate with an elevator, unless you're gonna do it the pushing button way, if you're gonna actually do a, a wireless integration with the elevator, you've gotta work with the elevator company. The elevator companies charge a lot of money and they take a long time. They, recently, they start charging even more money but not taking quite as long. But it's still, it's a ridiculous amount of money. It costs a lot more than the robot itself to integrate the elevator. And so that ends up being a, a pretty big barrier to the business. Um, that you know, we didn't really think about. We can we solve the elevator? Yeah, we we proved like within the first year that we could solve it, um, but we didn't understand what it would be like to solve it over and over again at every single building and how slow that is. Um, this is what we did at some point um, a couple of years ago. We built a robot that could push buttons, <laughs> um, uh, and this works. Um, we deployed it at about seven different hotels, um, somewhat successfully. But the problem is, it's it's, and it's a classic problem. You watch anybody's robot video, including mine, you see it works, and you think, oh, I saw it work. It doesn't work every time. 
we we deploy it and it's so, and we solve it by having retries. So if it doesn't if it misses the button and the floor doesn't go where it's supposed to go, you should ask how do you know what floor you're on, which is another whole technology, uh, because inside the elevator it's a Faraday cage and you can't talk to the network, and so you have to figure it out on your own. We use a barometer, um, but once you figure once the if it doesn't work, you go push the button again, right? But now people around the robot are seeing it do this and they're thinking, oh, that can't work. Oh, it failed. Oh, it's taking too long. This isn't a good solution. That's the, that's the idea. We don't want to ever have people thinking this isn't a good solution because when they think that, that especially if they're the people who are buying the solution, then they say, oh, I'm not going to buy this solution, right? Or I don't really need this solution. So that ended up being a big, um, a big challenge with this. We end up pulling this back. The real reason this was hard isn't pushing the buttons. The real reason this is hard is think about a robot that's integrated wirelessly with an elevator, right? So I'm I'm now I'm the robot, right? And I come here in the in the ele in the hall and I I don't push the hall call button, right? Those buttons in the hallway are called hall call buttons. I push, I tell the system wirelessly that I want to go to floor three. And it says car one is coming. And then I go stand right next to car one. And when car one comes, I tell the system, hold the door. And then I get in at my leisure, the robot, and I face the door. And after I face the door, I say, send the car to, to, floor, to car three or to floor three. And then I ride car one up to car three and I hold the door and I get out. Sounds, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of steps, but it's straightforward. Now imagine you're going to push the button in the hall. I push the hall call button. The first problem is which car is coming? I don't know. So how am I going to know? I got to go stand someplace where I can see all the cars at once, which may not be possible. You can solve this stochastically if you're willing to do retries, but as I said earlier, that doesn't always look good. Um, pick one that only has three or four cars. You can find a place to stand. You stand there. Now you've got a lot longer way to go and nobody's holding the door for you, right? And so you, you can solve it, but you look more aggressive because you're having to move fast. And so suddenly this um, robot that looks so cute when it rides the elevator when it's integrated looks a lot more aggressive and confused and is trying things over again when it doesn't have that. And that's what makes this hard. Um, that and the fact that for any robot you put in the world, you know, every degree of freedom is a failure point. Relay has four motors. It's got two drive motors, it's got a lid motor, and it's got a latch, right? And all those things should work. If the latch fails, it'll drive around. People won't know that it's not locked, but it's not locked and we should fix it, right? But you could, it can fail gracefully. If the lid doesn't work, when it gets to your room and the lid doesn't open, you're like, this thing's stuck. This thing's stupid. It doesn't work, right? I can't get my stuff. I'm supposed to, there's a Snickers bar in there and I can't get to it, right? So, the lid has to work every time. The, the wheels have to work every time. There's three motors, four motors, three motors that, can, that can't fail and one that shouldn't fail. Now you add two more motors, two more degrees of freedom to go up and push. You got two more failure points and a much harder problem. And the whole thing got heavier. Uh, and, and you see why it sort of compounds. And, and then ask me what I think about deploying humanoids in the world for real. Right? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. You got to really get the engineering up to a, a much higher level. Um, networks, I won't say a whole lot about this because I, I suspect I'm behind on time, um, but networks is also a really challenging problem. That's a surprise. Um, you put a robot in the world. We put all the sensors and processing we need on board so we can navigate autonomously. But if we're wirelessly integrated with the elevator, we can't get to our destination without the network. Um, if you have somebody monitoring the robot remotely and the network goes out, they can't monitor it. Um, and so you don't strictly need a network at all points, but you do have to solve the networking problem in a way that's good enough for whatever customer you're in. And then when you go into hospitals and you say, I'd like to put this robot on your network, please. And they say, you're going to what? <laughs> Does it have cameras? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you have like months of security reviews while you go through that, right? So these are like surprisingly um, networks has been and continues to be, we put on Relay today, we put Wi-Fi and LTE, right? like belt and suspenders, and we still have network problems on an installation. Once we get it working, it's working fine. It connects with the network, unless the network goes down, in which case they say your robot doesn't work, 
right? Or the elevator goes down, in which case to say your, your robot doesn't work. So you're dependent on other systems. Um, I won't go through any more of that. Uh, another challenge is labor unions. Just people believe robots are gonna take their jobs. Managers of hotels would believe that robots are gonna take, that, that, that people are gonna be afraid that these robots are gonna take their jobs and they're afraid that their team will strike and they won't even consider putting it in in many cases, especially in the early days. This was a, a big concern. Um, I think uh, it's easy to point after you've been in the market for a while that nobody's jobs were lost, but um, you know you have to sort of address this problem um, because it, it's a very real concern. But it's in case you get tired and can't make it to the show someday, yeah, this I, is we can program the, the machine Carson to do a commercial. Show. I don't remember Johnny Carson. This thing do the ad for you, so we don't need to have advertising. <laughs> now, what he's doing now is to program what he's going to have the machine do. This is Joe Engelberg, the father of. And he's putting this information into the machine. Now he's going to direct the band. I'm going to take the band director's job. Take it on the downbeat. So when I think about labor unions and why, why is the world burning about this? I'd say we brought this on ourselves. Um, this is a great clip if you ever watch the whole thing. It, it's hilarious because Johnny Carson starts the clip with a cigarette in his mouth. They're coming back from commercial and then he puts it out and throws it behind the desk, which is like he's in California. You don't smoke indoors in California. You never throw a lit cigarette behind on a set. It's like all these crazy things happened in the 60s. The world's changed. Um, I'll just say funding is a challenge for any startup company. Um, it's cyclical and it's trendy. Right now, if you want to start a company, you should definitely say you're using LLMs and AI. Um, uh, back in the 90s, you had to say, I'm doing an internet startup. There's, it's always something and you have to do that. Um, the last thing I'll say is I, I talked at the beginning about focus and how important focus is. Well, we shifted our focus, right, from hotels to hospitals. I mean, we'll still sell to hotels, but we know that the product market fit there, it's mainly about novelty or fitting in with the hotel's brand. It's not about saving labor or, or um, really making a difference to the operation of the hotel. But in, in hospitals, it matters. So we make a shift. But when you make a shift, you get new requirements. You've already built a robot. Now you have to deal with new requirements. So what about temperature control, right? This we have to make sure that the bin stays within one or two degrees of ambient because we're going to put samples in it. And we can't have them, you know, overheated or, or put medicines in. Um, how can I clean it? Um, the architecture in hospitals is different than the architecture in hotels. You would walk through a hospital or hotel. You would know I'm in a hotel or I'm in a hospital. And you probably didn't think about how you know that. But I'll tell you one way you know that is you're walking down the hallway and in a hotel and there's no windows. Right, maybe at the very end, but as you go down the ha hallway, it's carpeted because they want quiet. There's no windows. There's a lot of doors. Um, and relay works great in that environment. And then you go to a hospital. And in hospital, light is, is healing. And we have two-story windows in the atrium. And certain times of day, the sunlight streams across and just blinds your infrared sensors. Right, And, and so the robot's going, ah! And what doesn't go, ah, it just stops. Right, like I can't, I can't verify that I have a clear path, so I'm just going to stop. Well, then the customer says, "Why isn't your robot going?" Well, it's sunny here, and it worked this morning. Yeah, this morning the sun was over there, but now it's here. We had one hotel where we actually deployed in. We said you can't use it between two and four in the afternoon. Sorry, the rest of the time it works fine. Um, eventually, you have to solve that, right? You can't just tell the customers don't use it these times. And we literally have a part of the new robots called sunglasses, right? It's like um, filters to filter out what you need. Um, and of course, you, the business side, uh, as, uh, when I was purely a researcher and hadn't done a startup, I would just talk about the business guys. The business side, there's a lot of aspects of the business side, but an important one is um, marketing. How do you go to market? When you want to sell to, and actually when we went to sell to hotels, we, believed that we would basically, we had a connection with um, Starwood, which is now part of Marriott. We have a connection with Starwood. We're gonna get all the, someday we're gonna get all the courtyards. They'll buy, and there's 2000 courtyards. So we have 2000 robots we're gonna have. Um, it turns out brand is a franchiser, 
they don't buy robots. The general manager who we've been talking to said, we love this idea. We love this is going to be great for our customers. They don't buy robots. The owner of the building is going to make the decision. And until you figure out who's going to make the buying decision, it's hard. And then you shift and say, okay, now we're going to go into hospitals. This is a completely new ecosystem, right? The, who, the hospitals are organized often into chains. They're buying each other up right and left these days. And so you, do I need to talk to the CIO at the hospital or do I need to get the guy at the chain? It's a much harder sales process. That sales process is a challenge to your business, no matter how good your robot is. Um, so that's side note, but, but that's a change of, you know, if you started, if you, if you really, that's why you don't focus on many different domains. We, we were tempted. I started off and I said, Hey, this robot is going to be good for the service industry broadly. We're just starting in hotels, but I didn't understand that lesson about how hard it is and how different it is to go to each different market. Um, you have to fund your company to have marketing teams for each vertical. You can't just, you can explore whether it might work, but you're not going to actually attack a market unless you focus on that market. Okay, by the end, last part of the talk, I think we're okay on time. Um, uh, Stanford Robotics Center. So I joined in November. Um, it's nice to come back to Stanford. It's nice to come back to academia. It's a big mind shift for me, right? Because I had been in research for a long time. In the last 10 years, I was in startup mode where I don't want to tell everybody what we're doing because, you know, our proprietary advantage. Um, now we're open again, <laughs> and it's actually nice. I like being on this side of the fence. Um, the Stanford Robotics Center was um, is created. Osama Khatib uh, raised some money to do a big renovation um, and, and actually to acquire space in the electrical engineering building at Stanford, which is kind of centrally located. Stanford has about 24 robotics faculty, each with their own lab with about 20 people. So there's you know, probably 500 roboticists at Stanford. Um, and those labs tend to be, Stanford faculty tend to be very um, independent and they tend to be kind of silos, those labs. Osama created this center in order to try to break down those silos and get faculty to work together and get graduate students to work together. Um, this is some of the faculty uh, it turns out that even this thing, which um, I got a picture like this when I joined, uh, it changed. Uh, Sharon's song, I think, is on here. Maybe she's not. That's one, uh, I, the, the picture keeps changing because the faculty keep changing, There's, but not too rapidly. Some people stay a long time. This is what the center looks like. It's brand new. It's beautiful. Um, you, you walk in. It doesn't look like a basement anymore. It looks like a nice, bright space. Um, at the end is a pool designed, if you've seen the, Roshan, the robot Ocean One, that's where Ocean One's gonna uh, live and play when he's not out in the actual ocean. Um, it's got a bunch of different rooms. Here's a couple pictured, but it's got a full kitchen, a domestic suite, um, dance studio. Uh, it's got, it's got a, a large a HRI space, just kind of open at this point, a medical bay, field bay, warehouse bay, and then the pool that I mentioned. So it's, it's kind of cool and it'll bring people from these different labs to showcase what they do. And ideally we'll have projects in there. We call them flagship projects where people will work together. Um, and part of the reason I'm here, Sharon Sung came and gave a, a talk here. And then, and I talked to her at Stanford and she said, you got to go see Northwestern. They've got an amazing robotics center. So I'm here to learn. Um, and, and again, part of the collaboration across universities, let's try to figure out I'm trying to figure out how to make this as good as it can be and you know what programs should we have there. So as you, if you think of any, if you think like what I love about our robotics center is something, I'd really appreciate it if you shoot me a line because I'm, I'm trying to make sure that this is uh, an amazing place, not just the space, which is beautiful, but the programs that we run and the services that we offer. Again, thinking about the golden rule, right? My customers now are the faculty at Stanford and the graduate students at Stanford and, um, and the world at large, but how do I, how do I make an impact by having them work together? Um, one thing that I'm doing is trying to, to generate some focus. So senior independence, I think, is a really interesting and important problem, right? How do we help seniors in, uh, with activities they live in? And Brenna is uh, here, and work, we work together on a uh, mostly she worked and I, I tried to help <laughs> on a project to make a, a autonomous wheelchair. But, um, but these are 
these the list of six ADLs were defined in the 1960s. So 60 years old, like robotics, they've stood the test of time. These are the problems we have to solve. And if you're a roboticist and you look at this list and you say, how many of these can we really help with today, right? If somebody who can't dress themselves, what robot can they buy today to dress themselves, right? Or how can you or us, any of us, solve that problem? The answer is not really today, right? Maybe feeding, you see a couple of examples of feeding. Uh, my experience uh, with my aging parents, feeding is, it's not putting the spoon in their mouth that's hard, it's getting them to open their mouth, right? That's a different problem. Um, it's, I mean, missing would be bad, right? But, um, but getting them to open is also important. Um, and toileting, right? Particularly hard problem. So all of these require safely applying forces to very fragile, the most fragile members of the population. But we got to solve this, right? So I pro propose this is a challenge problem, like a 10-year, like let's go after this. And th the question is, if we really focus, how much of this can we do in 10 years? This is one dimension of, um, of kind of the vision. It's, it's very hard, as I said, to be focused in an academic institution. Everybody's going different ways. So the actual picture we have is something like this. Um, today, we have... Um, low technical assistance for the aging, we wanna obviously go up on that dimension, which, um, and then um, the other dimension we have is about um, remote presence, being able to act at a distance. Today we have video at a distance, which is pretty good, which we didn't have 10 years ago, right? Now we have good video at a distance, um, but how do we get to true avatars in that dimension? And how do we get to ADLs solved in the other dimension? And one of the professors at Stanford said, well, this is, you just want time and space. So that's my focus. Just, I wanna master time and space, which doesn't sound like a great focus, but it definitely covers everything or a lot of things. Um, okay, the last slide out is this one. Um, at Willow Garage, we started with money. Um, we started with a great budget. Um, and no people and no reputation. Um, and we built the reputation. So from money, like a, a proof case or an existence proof, from money, you can create reputation and, and you can attract people. At Relay, we started with people. We built a reputation somewhat. I mean, well, not, not probably about as, maybe about as famous as Will, or maybe not as famous. Um, you, you have to make money in a startup. And, and that's sort of the traditional way. And that's hard. Um, the Stanford Robotics Center, I, I'm excited about the opportunity for me because I start with people and reputation and some money. Um, and the goal is impact, right? Which is exactly why, you know, why I'm here and what I want to do with the next phase of my career. So um, anyway, that's a, a little background. And, and uh, at that point, hopefully I have time for some questions. Yes. It's it's a yeah. It, it's a great question. Or, yes, yeah. Thank you. So for people on Zoom, the question is, um, how do you decide when to open something? You know, it's open source worked really well in Will Garage. Um, how do you decide when to do that with a startup? Um, and and it's a great question, and it's really hard because in a startup, you have to be explaining to your funders and potential funders why you're creating value for them that they own, that's a competitive advantage. And so breaking that model is hard. It's hard to convince them. And if it's hard to go on working if you can't convince them because you need money to, to get started and get going. Um, I think th there are some nice counter examples of companies that start um, heavy open source. So Red Hat comes to mind, right? And is an ongoing commercial concern. Actually, the Open Source Robotics Foundation, which supports Ross, uh, you may have heard that uh, Intrinsic acquired OSRC, which was a for-profit corporation that the nonprofit created. 
You know, like, why did they do that? Um, it turned out that that was copied off of um, of uh, one of the other big open source projects. Um, no, not open, I way before that, a web one. But, um, but we weren't the first to do that corporation under the nonprofit thing. Um, the reason is that if you're, if you're a nonprofit um, and you get money, you can't, there's no, you can't have a profit and you can't hold a ton of money for a long time. That's the, that's the rules of being a nonprofit. So if you get money and you're a nonprofit, um, you have to spend it. Um, there's an interesting example of, I think, Bechtel in, I in Ohio helped Xerox out before they were Xerox, when they were the Hayward Corporation. And Xerox had exponential growth in the 60s, just like Google did. Um, and Bechtel ended up with these windfall profits as a nonprofit. And so they owned buildings like crazy, because they were taking their money and just buying buildings and building buildings, because that's one thing that they could do with the money. Um, in, um, it's a company that uh, was making a web, web browser, is what I'm thinking of, that uh, I'm blocking on the name. Um, Maybe, Mo maybe Mozilla. Yeah, maybe it was Mozilla. Um, anyway, they, they had a, a for-profit subsidiary because Google was paying them a dollar per web browser per download for putting the Google search bar on in the early days. That was Google's marketing technique. That dollar, and the, the thing took off like wildfire and you had like millions and millions of people adopting this thing. So you had millions of dollars coming into this nonprofit. They created a for-profit to handle that. Um, and sort of transferred the assets to it. And then they owned the, the, the for-profit. Google did, I'm going a long way, but Ross did the same thing. Open Source Robotics Foundation did the same thing, created a corporation so that we could take consulting dollars that weren't consistent with, weren't completely consistent with the mission. Eventually that the Ross team was living there and then Intrinsic bought them. But in exchange for that sale, OSRF has now an endowment that they never had before. So Ross is actually in better shape than it ever was because Intrinsic is continuing to support Ross, but OSRF actually has money to do other things. And there's, there's a new initiative coming out that's making sort of bringing more companies into the fold. So, um, I mean, I'm a board member of OSRF. You know, our job as board members of a nonprofit is to make this thing fulfill its mission, which is to make Ross go on and, and be successful for all of you. Um, long answer, but I, I think, you know, there are examples of mixing uh, profit, but it, and examples of uh, open source projects that become very successful. Um, but there's also a lot more examples of people building stuff and selling it and keeping the details secret. And it, you have to make a decision based on your situation and your funders and what you can get away with, whether you can do open source when you're in a startup. But in academia, it's a winning strategy, right? It's absolutely a winning strategy because you want to have openness. You want to have share of ideas. You want to have people at other universities repeating your experiments. That was the whole PR2 goal. Yes. Well, so the so, um, so the the living space is. I mean, when you want to have, I mean, nobody's going to live in there. Let's say it's it's in a Stanford building, but it's designed to be like a, a real living space. And so this is where we can develop robots that know how to navigate around beds. If we're going to make beds, you have a bed to make, right? It, it exists for that purpose. Um, so people aren't going to live there. Robots will learn to operate there and then hopefully go out into other spaces. Um, the dance studio, um, and there, there's a sense when Osama was creating the center that we want to have a tie to the arts. Um, and so that's one obvious tie. And you see a lot of, um, of senior roboticists um, uh, thinking of, uh, you know, making the robots dance these days, right? So, so robots dancing is something we like to do. It, it, it's an artsy thing, but I also argue um, if, if you can have a robot that can dance with a person, that's probably a robot that can also help a person, right? You've now got a robot that is, you know, imagine the extreme case doing the tango, right? 
And if you, if you don't kill somebody, then you're probably good enough to help a lot of other people live for a long time, right? And so um, I think, you know, having the dance studio there is, you know, in the dance studio, of course, is a sprung floor with uh, the right surface for dancing. It's called Marley um, and with a, a mocap system. So you can, and, and suits for the dancers. So we can, we can really use it to, um, to tie dance to robotics in interesting ways. Um, I know everybody's nervous about putting robots in there and messing with the floor. Um, so depending on your robot and what kind of wheels it has will, will be a, a decision, but yeah. All right. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much.